uh, real joy that I invite you to join me in the study of the eternal Word of God. We come to you daily, or as often as we can get to you there, uh, uh, with these precious lessons teaching you the Word of God from Genesis through to the book of Revelation. And in our special group of lessons that we're bringing to you at this moment, we're teaching you relative to the altars and the offerings unto the Most High God. Uh, it's very significant. Uh, it began in Genesis. It didn't start in the Middle Ages. It began in the book of Genesis. It began in the Garden of Eden. It began with Adam and Eve. Uh, the, God took the life of two little animals and gave them covering for their sins. They, they made them coats of skin that they were covered uh, for, for their sins. And from that moment until Calvary, uh, this same substitutionary method was used for removing of sins from people. In our lessons, uh, we went from the, the birth of the altars uh, through the patriarchs, the, the great men, you know. Uh, there was Adam, and there was Abel, and they offered his offering, and there was Noah, and there was Abraham, and, and many others. The patriarchs and their offerings. Then we showed you how God re received an offering for a nation. They could offer an offering on the altar, and it represented the total nation uh, as, as well as a person. And then we reveal to you the types of, of uh, animals, uh, uh, creatures that were used for offerings. Uh, unclean animals, pigs were not permitted to be an offering, of course. A giraffe was not permitted to be an offering. A hippopotamus was not permitted to be an offering. The, the clean animals, uh, which were actually the edible animals uh, for human uh, eating, uh, were the ones that were, uh, were offered to God for an offering against sin. And then we, we, we taught you about the sin offering and the trespass offering. And in the sin offering, uh, we saw that it had to do uh, for a condition. That sin is a condition. A man is born into sin, and he is a sinner. He automatically sins as he lives. And then the trespass offering was for a specific thing uh, that man had done. And then we came to the peace offering that we make before the Lord, and then a wave offering that we wave unto the Lord. These were special offerings that were given unto the Most High. And we would like to bring you now to what we call an ignorance offering and also an accident offering. And then we will also mention to you the offering for the poor uh, that they could give, and even the maybe offering. And we will get into that, and to the, also the praise offering and the, and the meal offering unto the Lord. These are very important. And if you will, will begin with me in Leviticus chapter 4, we will read to you verses 27 and 28. If any one of the common people sin, now that meant the common meant they weren't of the priestcraft, they weren't of high position, and if they sin through ignorance, through ignorance, as you notice it said common people, it did not say the leaders, uh, which he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of, the, of, the, of Jehovah concerning those things which ought not to be done and be guilty, you see. Isn't that great reading? Isn't that tremendous reading? Or if he sin which he has sinned and it come to his knowledge uh, that he's done wrong, then, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin which he hath committed. And he shall bring it unto the priest as a sweet savor unto the Lord, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. So isn't that really beyond your thinking, uh, that God remembered the ignorant, that did things ignorantly. They didn't know they were doing wrong. But when they found out they were doing wrong, they were to bring an offering unto God. It was hidden from their eyes, but was against one of the written commandments of God. We could read a lot about that in the Bible, I'm sure. Uh, in Ephesians 4 and 18, it tells us that our sins can alienate us from God by ignorance. Alienate us from God. And so one must not remain ignorant. One might be ignorant, but he must not remain ignorant. And in Romans 10, uh, verses 3 to 11, it tells about those who are ignorant of God's righteousness ignorant of God's righteousness, going about trying to establish their own righteousness, ignorant of God's righteousness. Uh, if a person is ignorant, they should learn. I mean, God cannot wink at ignorance always. In fact, he says that in 2 Peter 3 and 5 at the time uh, uh, of this ignorance, God winked at. And, and those who are willingly ignorant, there are people that are willing, they want to be ignorant. Well, man will be brought to justice and he will be brought before God to give an account for ignorance. And so don't depend on that to, to get you to heaven. Now, not only can there be an individual or person 
uh, who is involved in ignorant sins. In Leviticus 4 and 13, it says, And if the whole congregation of Israel, that means an entire nation, everybody, if they sin a sin through ignorance, you see, isn't that something? A whole nation sent a sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which, they, which should not be done, and are guilty when the sin which they have sinned against it is known. Now, you see, the law was lost at times in their history, and they didn't know, and sometimes they had to read it for weeks to catch up on it. In the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, and in those days, and the people would weep and wail and say, we were ignorant. We were ignorant of these laws. And, and then it says, when they know it, then the congregation should offer a young bullock for their sins and bring them before the tabernacle of the congregation. And so it was in God's heart uh, to forgive. And even when a nation sinned ignorantly, they could get forgiveness of their sins. That's true today. India could get forgiveness of its sins. Tibet could get ignorance of its sins. Uh, any land in the world could turn to the living God and say, we through ignorance have not served you. Please forgive us. And God would forgive them through the Lord Jesus Christ and would be glad to. And, and we are told that in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, that at the time of this ignorance, God winked at. And that word doesn't mean uh, making fun like we do today, but God just closed his eyes to it and says, I forgive you because you did it in ignorance. I forgive you. And God is a good God by doing that. But that same verse says, but now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent for the simple reason uh, that we have today. We have today the written word of God. There's no reason for any person on the face of this earth to be ignorant. There are literally millions of Bibles so we can know the truth of God and how to live. Now, a person could also do this in ignorance. In Leviticus chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, it says, if a, if a soul commit a trespass, now that, that means a man or a woman, a man or a woman commit a trespass and sin through ignorance. You know, they didn't know it. They sent through ignorance in, in the holy things of the Lord. Then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of his flock, without estimation of shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. And he shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing, and, and shall add a fifth part thereto, and give it unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. And so here is a man or a woman who can commit a sin through ignorance, and God can help them. Now, not only through ignorance could God forgive you, but by an accident, an accident, God can forgive you also. If you hurt a person accidentally or something like that and you want forgiveness. In Leviticus chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, it says, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden uh, to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wished it not, though, you see, though, though he didn't know anything about it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. And verse 18 says, And he shall bring a ram and, of the flock uh, without blemish, for a trespass offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his ignorance, wherein he erred, and wished not that it, and it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against uh, the Lord. And, and so uh, uh, even though he has something to happen to him that he didn't expect to happen, uh, God can forgive him of that. In Numbers uh, chapter 15 and verse 30 says, But the soul that doth ought presumptuously, this is a presumptuous sin. Uh, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same uh, reproach the Lord. And that soul should be cut off from among his people. You see, if he does it presumptuously, he can bring an offering to the Lord for his presumptuous sin. Now, there are people today uh, that are very presumptuous. They think they know more than God. They know more than the Bible. And then they suddenly discover the heaven. God forgives you for that too. And God will forgive you of anything that you've ever committed. Hebrews 10, 20, he says, He that, that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Even though he was presumptuous and he despised Moses' law, he died according uh, to the law. And we ought, to, uh, we ought to understand that and to realize that. Uh, in Leviticus uh, 5 and 7, it says, and if, and if he be not able to bring a lamb, uh, now he can be a very poor person, and I'm glad for God doing this, uh, then he can bring for his trespasses which he has committed two turtle doves. And, and, and two young pigeons under the Lord, one for sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. 
and he shall bring them unto the priest, who shall offer them for the sin offering first, and wring off the head of the neck, and divide it asunder. He shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering before the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the manner of the priest shall make the atonement for him for his sin, which he has sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. God always provides mercy for those who have come to him, even in hard times. Even in hard times. Do you, you hear me? <laughs> I, I have uh, uh, news for you, though. Nobody could come without some kind of offering. You, didn't, you just did not appear before God empty-handed, or you got turned away. Because God knew you were a liar, and that you were a cheater, and that you weren't telling the truth at all, so he didn't receive you. Uh, th there was an accommodation made here for those that were poor, and, and God does the same today. It don't matter how poor you are, God loves you, and he wants to enrich you, he wants to make you prosperous, and you have to fall into, the, the, the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. The farmer says, plant, and you shall have a harvest. You better listen to him, because he's telling you, the facts of life. The poor were not expected to compete with the rich. Uh, we don't compete in God's things. Uh, we give to God what belongs to God, and we live for God as He'd have us to live for Him, and that is the way He would have us to live. One of the offerings that I have, uh, I, that I've made <laughs> personally, I call it the, the may be offering. The may be offering. In Job 1 and 5, it says, as it was so when the days of their feasting was gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of all of his children. For Job said, maybe, that's the maybe offering, maybe my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And Job did this continually. If you mothers and fathers could ever read that and get it down into your heart, what a difference you would make in the world today. Here was a maybe offering. Brother, he made offerings in advance. He didn't know but what his children would get over there by themselves and misbehave. And he said, maybe. He didn't even know they'd done wrong. He said, possibly they've done wrong, and I want to offer an offering to God in, in case they did do something wrong. This is one of the most exciting offerings in the whole Bible. It is the maybe offering. And Job did not know whether his sons had sinned or not. Job wanted to be, to be right in the sight of God. He wanted his children to be right in the sight of God. He wanted the communion of his family to be right in the sight of God. And so, and so Job, Job said, I, I am a perfect man. I hate wickedness, and I love God, and I want my children to love God. Therefore, he, he, he created this very particular offering unto him. And, and how glad we are for such an offering. Uh, an offering that's very interesting in the, in, in the Old Testament was what we call the meal offering. In Leviticus 6 and 14, it says, and this is the law of the meal offering. Uh, in English there you have the word meat, M-E-A-T, uh, but in the original it is meal, and as you can see, it tells you that it's meal, and so th there's no problem there. Uh, offered by the sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord before, uh, before him. Uh, this meal offering is uh, uh, very interesting to you and to me because it's made up of flour and of oil and frankincense. In all the other translations of the world, they have it, meal offering, because in verse 15, it says, and he shall take a handful of the flour, flour of the meal uh, offering and, uh, and the oil thereof and the frankincense which is upon the meal offering and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor, even a memorial of it under the Lord, even a memorial of it under the Lord. And in verse 16 it says, And the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with unleavened bread, as shall it be eaten in the holy place, in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation shall they eat it. And it shall not be bacon, it shall not be baked with leaven. I, I have given it unto you for the portion of my offerings by fire. Uh, it is most holy, it is, as is, the, as is the sin offering and the trespass offering. God said, one is holy and the other is holy. And then he says, all the males of the children uh, of, the, of Aaron, of the, those that work in the temple, like the pastor and his sons and his wives and so forth, the, it, it shall be a statue forever in your, in your congregations according to the offerings that the Lord has made. And everyone that toucheth them shall be holy. 
that was only for, for God's people to touch it, no one else. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and for his sons, and so forth, and told them all about how they were to receive it. And this meal offering uh, for the priest shall be wholly burnt, it, uh, and, and it shall not be eaten. The part that was offered unto God there. You say, what kind of offering was it? Uh, in verse 1, it says it's a fine offering uh, with a fine flour. Uh, and it says in verse 1 also, He shall pour oil upon it. And this speaks of the fragrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there shall be no leaven put in it. It shall be pure truth, just truth. No honey, no artificial sweetening. Uh, it says no oil. oil. Oil shall be mingled with it. Christ was born of the power of the Holy Spirit, typical of oil, and then it was put uh, to the fire. This speaks of the perfection of the offerings of the Lord Jesus Christ. His character, lacking nothing, he stood true. He was, uh, he was, he was persecuted even unto death, and he remained true under the Lord. This meal offering that we're talking about here was what is called a sweet savor under the Lord. You read that in Leviticus chapter 2 and verses 2 to 9. This meal offering was pleasant unto God. There is no sin offering uh, bearing related to it uh, for the forgiveness of this offering. Uh, many, the meal offering was a flora offering in contrast to the fauna offering. The fauna, as, as you know, means an animal, and the flora means that which is grown out of the ground. The meal offering was bloodless, the, uh, no death, as in the burnt offering. Uh, the King Dane Version re, 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 calls it meat, uh, but all other versions call it meal. And in Genesis 1.29, it speaks about the fruit and the vegetables, and they are all called meat, meat as food in, in that area. So this meal offering was a voluntary offering. Uh, you read that in Leviticus 2 and 1. It was a voluntary offering that, that could be offered under the Lord. It was not compulsory. You did not have to do it. This meal offering uh, was only, only part consumed. The burnt offering was, was entirely burnt, but this offering was only partly consumed. The meal offering was a type of Christ. The burnt offering is a type of Christ's death. And the meal offering was a type of Christ alive here on this earth. And here he met the needs of humanity. And in Numbers chapter 29 and verse 6 and also in Exodus 29 and 38, these offerings were always offered together. Offered together. The meal offering was offered at the, in the altar every morning and every evening. The meal offering was offered for the entire nation, Leviticus 6 and 20. The meal offering was offered to be a perpetual offering before the Lord. The, the meal offering represented the whole nation to God, for, looking for their perfection, uh, looking for them to live the beautiful life uh, before the Lord. The meal offering was anointed with oil. You read that in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1. It, the oil was poured over the flour. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the fine flour of Christ's perfect perfect life is, uh, is announced here, and, and that's exactly what it was. And this, this fragrant a smoke that went up before the Lord, it says God was pleased with it. God was pleased with it. In Leviticus 24, 5 and 7, the showbread cakes with frankincense, frankincense on the top of it was, a, was of a fire that drew the fragrance from the frankincense, and this was the meal offering unto the Lord. The meal offering was seasoned. Uh, was seasoned. Mark 9, 49 says that the salt was added uh, for every sacrifice. Salt in the Bible is the emblem of incorruption. Salt is also the emblem of divine grace, and it is a seasoning quality that God puts in it. The spiritual life is the best life. The Christian life is the best life. There's no other life so great and so wonderful as the, as the Christ life. Now, there were things not in the meal offering. There was no leaven. That's in Leviticus uh, 2 and verse 11. Uh, and leaven has fermentation in it, and it, it has corruption in it, and there was no leaven in it. Jesus said in, in, in Luke's Gospel 12 and 1 that leaven is hypocrisy, and God wanted no hypocrisy in his worship. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 that leaven is pride. God wanted no pride in his worship and in his offerings to him. Paul further said in Galatians 5 and 9 that leaven is a false teaching. We want to know false teachings, you see, in, 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 this, in this offering unto him. Leaven puffs up. That's what leaven is for. It puffs up. It swells the bread. And that's in 1 Corinthians 5 and 2. God don't want any puffed up business. He wants us all to be humble before him and to love him. In Exodus 23 and 18, leaven had to be called out of that, took, taken out of the house during the time of the Passover. God wouldn't even permit it in the house 
they had to look throughout even in the corners of the cupboards and take it all out. In the meal offering, uh, uh, honey was forbidden, uh, and that's in verse 11. Uh, honey can produce fermentation. Uh, no offering to God could include honey. Honey with, with heat turned on uh, would turn sour, and, and so uh, it, it, could not, it, it could not be put in. Honey represents the attractiveness of the human personality, uh, which can go sour under affliction. And, and God knows that, and he didn't want any honey whatsoever in it. Honey is a, is, is a pleasant thing to nature, uh, and it's, it's, it's tasty, you know, to the lips and, and, and so forth. And human sweetness cannot stand the test of what we're talking about. We're talking about forgiveness of sins, eternal life with God, and in those things, we need the mighty power of the Most High God to help us and to keep us. And God said, we're going to keep it pure, and there will be no sweetness about it whatsoever. We will keep it just so man can get himself right with God and love God with all of his heart. The meal offering uh, presented the, uh, the worshipers uh, to God. You know, it presented the worshipers to God that they might have a beautiful knowledge of Him, a great knowledge of Him, and it was a tremendous thing in bringing the worshiper into his relationship with the Most High God. In Deuteronomy 2 and 9 to 16, uh, you read those gracious words. Uh, this offering came before God as a memorial unto God. It reminded God of His people that loved Him, of His people that worshiped Him, of His people that walked with Him. It was a perpetual offering. This meal offering was offered before the nation every day uh, before God as a remembrance, bringing into God's remembrance that he had a people down here that wanted to serve him, that loved to serve him, that had a heart to serve him, and therefore it was a very, very important offering, the meal offering unto God. Possibly being two loaves, it could represent the Jew and the Gentile. Uh, that's in Leviticus 23 and 17. He said, let there be two loaves. Uh, this offering was offered uh, also as a feast and at the feast of Pentecost. Uh, that, that's, that's when it was offered. And so it could be very important in that that was the day the church was born with all the praises, all the adoration, all the glory. That's the day it was born. They were way before the Lord by the high priest. All these offerings were special. In Leviticus 23 and 5, the Passover was special, the lamb slain and, and eaten, verses 10 and 11, the first, the first fruit feast day, a sheaf wave uh, before the Lord. In verses 15 to 17 at Pentecost, the loaves were waved, uh, were laid before the Lord. And, and so this meal offering uh, was something that was present in all of their feast days. The, the meal offering was not fully consummated uh, until it was into the fire. In verse 3, only the priests I could eat of this as it was cooked. It was the holy offering unto the Lord. Leviticus 6, 16 says it could, be, could not be consumed outside the sanctuary. It had to be kept within the sanctuary. This speaks to us of the fellowship that we have with the Lord, that it's for the Lord and the Lord's people only. Sinners do not have it, cannot get it. All these offerings were types and symbols of the fulfillment of Christ in His church for His church today, and that all these are in Christ uh, fully and that you are in Christ, and that you can have all the blessings, all the blessings that Moses ever had, all the blessings that, that uh, David ever had, all the blessings that Solomon ever had, all the blessings that Ezra or Nehemiah ever had, or Isaiah or Jeremiah ever had. You have today. You're not short. <laughs> uh, you haven't come up saying, well, they got it, but I don't get it. And I'd like to say to those theologians who say that 2,000 years ago God did great things, but He's not doing them right now, you've just missed it too. Because all that God has ever done, God is doing today. All the power He ever released, He is releasing today. All the forgiveness that He ever forgave, He is forgiving today. You are not eating the leftovers of yesterday's feasts. Today is the day of the banquet. Today is the day of ceremony. Today is the day of shouting. Today is the day of release. Come unto God with all of your heart. Find in the Lord Jesus Christ the fulfillment of the complete Old Testament. Find in the Lord Jesus Christ the total fulfillment of all the good things that are spoken in the Word of God, and you'll be glad that you did. You'll certainly be glad that you did. And in, in these altars and in these sacrifices of the Old Testament, you find the exact picture of Jesus Christ, that He came to fulfill all things, that He came to bring into us total truth. He came to bring into us absolute salvation, whatever you need today. Christ loves you. He's reaching for you. He wishes to help you. Will you receive it now? Your will is the only thing left. If you desire it, you may have it. Are you ready for it right now? If you are, let's look up to God and believe for it. God, I believe you right now. 
for the forgiveness of sins. I believe you right now for the mercies of God. I believe you right now, Lord, to reach down in each heart and take out of them every sin. And let the offerings be waved unto God with great thanksgiving today. And let us all shout the praises of God for the victories we have won in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not defeated and we are not cast down. We are God's victors on the face of this earth, looking for the soon coming of the Master from heaven. Keep us by your great power and by your great mercies. And I thank you for it.